It's hard to know where to begin with a man like Stephen Hawking, if only because he crossed so many boundaries. He was 76 when he died earlier this morning, and that in itself was extraordinary. When he was diagnosed with motor neuron disease as a young student, he was given only two years to live. He lived for another 52 The disease ravaged his body, but not his mind. He was a hugely respected theoretical physicist. He changed the way we think about the universe. And for a man who could not utter a syllable, he was a brilliant communicator. Not every theoretical physicist writes a best-selling book, and here he is giving a lecture, his Wreath Lecture, in 2016. From my own perspective... It has been a glorious time to be alive and doing research in theoretical physics. There is nothing like the eureka moment of discovering something that no one knew before. So my advice to young scientists is to be curious and try to make sense of what you see. We live in a universe governed by rational laws that we can discover and understand. Despite recent triumphs, there are many new and deep mysteries that remain for you to solve. And keep a sense of wonder about our vast and complex universe and what makes it exist. But you also must remember that science and technology are changing our world dramatically, so it's important to ensure that these changes are heading in the right directions. In a democratic society, This means that everyone needs to have a basic understanding of science to make informed decisions about the future. So communicate plainly what you are trying to do in science, and who knows, you might even end up understanding it yourself. Well, that was Professor Hawking. Let's talk about him with Professor Carlos Frank, who is Director of the Institute for Computational Cosmology at Durham University, and Professor Brian Cox, Professor of Physics at Manchester University, and, of course, well-known broadcaster. Where did he stand, Brian? Let me put this to both of you, but, Brian, first, where, where, where did he stand in the ranks of theoretical physicists? Oh, I think he is one of the the greats. Um, there are There are many good theoretical physicists uh, who make a big contribution, but there aren't that many greats. And by that, I mean that I think if there are physicists in a thousand years' time, they will still be talking about Hawking radiation. Hmm. They will be using his fundamental results on black holes. I mean, actually, the, the last time I saw him at his 75th birthday party, he was he was talking about the new gravitational wave experiments where we've seen the collisions of black holes and, and speculating that those results might be able to, to prove some of his theorems once and for all. So the, there's that. And, and plus his contributions to the physics of the very early universe. Um, so there are at least three and possibly more Carlos or probably at least more uh, areas <laughs> where, where his work will be remembered as long as there are cosmologists. And that's the best you can hope for as a scientist. Mm, Carlos? Well, yes, I, uh, I think uh, what Brian just said is absolutely correct. Uh, he was a man who changed the panorama of uh, theoretical physics in the 20th century. He uh, his contributions were enormous. Uh, they were also very unique because, of course, the limitations he had physically made it force him to do science in a particular style. It's just mathematics, for example, he was incapable of writing pages and pages of mathematical derivations. So he invented a new way to express concepts mathematically, which were ideally suited to give us a profound insight, for instance, into the nature of black holes. So his work is unique. His imagination was unbounded. He was a man uh, trapped in a body, but free in his mind. And um, in a way, you can see how his science reflected the special conditions in, in which he lived. No, that, that's me, right. Just but before you leave that, that's, that's fascinating thought. In, in what sense did his uh, mind reflect his body? Well, because uh, his body limited the way that what he could do. In particular, he, he, he couldn't work like most of us do, either writing down equations on a piece of paper or sitting in front of a computer uh, typing computer code. He couldn't do that. He had to abstract. He had to be able to synthesize and to express very concisely. Because also, uh, for most of his life, he couldn't even speak. So uh, to communicate with others, he had to find a way 
to be very, very concise. Uh, the book here where I learned relativity, in fact, um, that he wrote with George Ellis, it is just a masterpiece. It's a jewel that's unlike any other book, just because of the way in which the concepts are expressed. Mm. Uh, and uh, I remember, you know, in those days, uh, long equations were, were the norm. In physics, his book has not a single long equation, but he has the most profound thoughts. It's just pure, sheer beauty and logic. How oh, interesting. And, and Brian, a question I was going to put to you, but <laughs> but probably wrong question. Well, it was certainly the wrong question on the basis of what Carlos was just saying. One wonders a bit, I suppose, whether, because you <sighs> scientists, I've heard it said, can be a little bit competitive occasionally with each other, just, just occasionally. <laughs> uh, I, I wonder whether he was ever, or whether it was ever said of him in, in your profession that, that he was cut a bit of slack because he was so desperately disabled but fought through it. No, absolutely not. Mm. And and he said himself, I think, that um <clears throat> that, that his his disability that, that the realization that he may not have long to live, as you said in, in his introduction, in your introduction, um stimulated him to, to go more deeply into physics and to, to to give his life to physics essentially. And and you heard it in that brilliant uh section from the Reith lectures mm. there. What, what I think is remarkable about him, the thing that first inspired me when I read his book, when I was 20 years old, when A Brief History of Time came out, was that mixture of, of, of brilliance in physics, but also that sense of, of, of wonder, which he spoke to directly in that clip, and that the sense of possibility that he, he felt that very strongly that, that, that we can understand the universe and it is a wonderful thing to try and do in itself. And I think that comes across. And so those are the two strands of his work that I think made such a big impact. The, the brilliance, a brilliant scientist, but also a truly brilliant communicator. Well, uh, I I indeed, but you say we can understand the universe. The, <laughs> the sad reality is that most of us obviously can't. In fact, we, we often can't understand the language in which you people speak. So is it possible for you, both of you, to give us an example, an illustration of what Stephen Hawking discovered that we would be able to understand. I mean, we, we, we lose it at all sorts of points. So, Brian, and, and you're the consummate communicator. So uh, there's, the, there's the challenge for you. I'll give you one example, which is that he showed that... So black holes, which are the, the, the picture of a black hole, a completely collapsed star, is something from which nothing can escape. Right. And that's the kind of the picture we have. So you fall in and you're gone forever. But what he showed is that, no, they have a temperature... So they, they radiate away into space and ultimately it would, would evaporate away into the universe again. And that's called Hawking radiation. And that, that idea that these things, if, you, if things fall into a black hole, they're not gone from the universe forever. The black hole gives its contents back to the universe eventually is absolutely fundamental and, and will be... As I said, that, that will be a result that's remembered forever. And, and why is it absolutely fundamental? Because... Well, go on. It, well, well it, it's, it's often described as being one of the first windows onto a theory beyond Einstein's theory of gravity. So we talk about general relativity, which is the framework which, within which Stephen works, that was first published in 1915. Uh, we know there's more. And Hawking radiation is, is a glimpse, uh, the, the crack in the door, if you like, through which we might glimpse the new theory. Carlos? Yes, let, let me highlight a completely different, uh, gigantic contribution that Stephen made. And that is related to why we're here, why the universe is interesting, why there are galaxies, stars, planets, and ultimately people. So this is one of the big revolutions in physics today is that we have gained some understanding of our origins in the deepest possible level. Now, Stephen was one of the first people who highlighted something which at first sight uh, maybe will reinforce your idea that physics is complex, but uh, it is not. I mean, it is uh, essentially, the universe is simple, it's just big, it's simple. But the idea that uh, Stephen and others had was that all structure in the universe, galaxies and so on, began life from tiny fluctuations of subatomic origin, what we call quantum fluctuations. So he actually worked out how these very tiny irregularities in the early universe would seed the universe with uh, the small perturbations that over the, um, uh, the billions of years would grow into the galaxies that we see today. He was a pioneer, not just in our study and understanding of black holes, but also 
in an understanding of the complexity and beauty of the universe. So he's one of the uh, founders, really, of modern cosmology in this respect. So he, his achievements are enormous. They're huge. Now, well, it's interesting. He never got the Nobel Prize. <clears throat> and he said that, well, he would have got the Nobel Prize had anybody seen one of these black holes that Brian was talking about evaporate. Yes. And we haven't seen them evaporate, uh, possibly because uh, you have to wait a very, very long time before this process uh, <laughs> occurs, and we didn't have enough time. Unfortunately, <laughs> more, more, there was not enough time for him. Well, indeed, more, more time than we have on this programme, sadly. Thank you both very much indeed, Carlos Frank and Brian Cox. Thank you both.